late or what, but uh, we're, going to, we're going to uh get started. Uh, today we have uh Thea Miller Ryan, Ryan, <laughs> and uh, we're going to be talking about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, and uh, we're gonna. Um, I see we have one name that I'm not sure I know somehow. Um, so I, let's go around and, and just introduce ourselves. And the question of the day is um, what, how would you define enthusiasm? Okay, how would you define enthusiasm? And we're gonna end up with uh, uh, Thea because um, she's going to be our, our, the person who's going to lead us through a conversation about uh, enthusiasm. So let's start off with um, uh, Alphonse. What do you think enthusiasm means, at least to you? <laughs> Well, it's it's an, a zealous joy of being engaged. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> a zealous joy of being engaged. That's a very nice uh, definition. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us what you think how you would define enthusiasm. <clears throat> Did you say Deb? A bar. Oh, a bar. Oh, oh, okay. Here's the name. Oh. Um, I just think enthusiasm is probably being ready for almost anything. And now it's ready to try, even if it sounds like something difficult y'all give it your best mm -hmm. excellent excellent barb yes lawrence i i really liked alphonse's and deb's definition and the only thing i can add is it's a certain zest for life miss mm -hmm. mm -hmm. jennifer uh i would say I do really like that zestful joy thing. Um, I typically think of it as just a positivity and excitement. So there's a level of mental and emotional energy um, about a thing, a person, an activity, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So positive energy. Okay, good. Charles? version of what others have said love of life no matter what would you say that again it was a little love of life no matter what mm. okay good and uh how about ryan yeah i would agree with all those and also just kind of being engaged in life and being interested in things and just briefly i want to mention that um my inspiration for this topic was, I wonder why some people have that natural enthusiasm and some don't. And I imagine we'll be getting into, into that today, so. Good. And now we're going to uh, get introduced to our uh, guest today, our, our featured uh, interviewee. And uh, Thea, tell us a little bit well, one, what you, how you would define enthusiasm, and then tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of like who is Thea. Okay, cool. So I'm the enthusiastic guest, I guess. <laughs> um, um, I define enthusiasm as something that you're passionate about, and you may not even know it, but all of a sudden you you realize, oh, I know a lot about this, and I feel like I can talk about it and I can get really excited about it. So to me, it's enthusiasm is a passion. Um, and sometimes those passions surprise you. So um, I'm from Pierre, South Dakota. I grew up there uh, very close to Jennifer. <laughs> and, um, 
I, uh, let's see, I worked for 25 years with South Dakota Game Fish and Parks as the director of the outdoor campus. And for the last year and a little bit, I've been with the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of South Dakota. So it was time for me to make a big change in my life after 25 years. And uh, I, I did, and I love it. So what Osher does, what the OLLI is the name of the program, and what OLLI does is uh, provide college-like education classes that are um, test-free. You don't have to take tests, and there's no grades. And you can take as many classes as you want. And uh, they've all, we did this gigantic U-turn in March. And so all of our classes right now are on uh, Zoom, like it is here. So that's really fun. And um, I've just met so many incredible people through Ollie. I had no idea all of that, all of the uh, talent and people willing to donate their time and topics and just amazing things. Ollie was the best next step for me. It was really good. <laughs> I love it as an Ollie member. It keeps the cobwebs out of this gray matter a little bit. That's always good. Thank and you. it's so fun because we take classes, some from professors, but some from just someone who's passionate about it. And you you don't sometimes go into a class, just kind of, you're kind of faintly interested in it. By the time you leave, you're just about as passionate as the instructor about it. Because they just infuse you with their passion and stuff. It's so fun. It is. Thanks. It's a great endorsement, I'll tell you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. I I joined probably about five, six years ago. I went with a friend. They used to always have classes where two or three a year you could bring non members. And I went with this friend that I worked with one and I was hooked. I've gone every year, every term since then. I love it. Mm -hmm. And to me it's like it's like a hidden gem or something. Not, I had never even heard of it before I joined. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people haven't. <laughs> I admit that I waver between telling people and not telling people. It's like, <laughs> I don't want to keep it a little secret. <laughs> Just me and a few people know about it. But then I think, okay, you can come, but don't tell too many people. <laughs> <laughs> That's not right either. That's like, I, I want to save her from myself. Great. Well, let's get into our, our discussion. Whoa, uh, whoa, 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 hold on just a minute. What are you trying to keep secret from me? What, what? <laughs> I came in, I missed some stuff, what? <laughs> So we're talking about enthusiasm today, and we're uh, just talking, and uh, Theo was just starting to uh, get into her discussion about, we're going to talk about uh, uh, enthusiasm and learn about, well, we won't tell you, you'll learn about it. <laughs> There's all kinds of things. So uh, Thea, could you... Um, start off by telling us a little bit about your ideas for or about enthusiasm. We were talking before about a definition, but how does it play and, and what does it do in life for you? Um, well, that's a really good question because I used to, I do a lot of talks to, um, Kiwanis clubs and optimist clubs and those kind of organizations. And when I had finished, I, I usually brought, when I work for Game Fish and Parks, I usually brought animal furs with me or skulls or rubber tracks or sometimes rubber poop. <laughs> and, uh, and we'd give this talk and at the end, people would say, how can you be so enthusiastic about poop? But I am so, <laughs> like Deb said, I'm so intrigued by about raccoon poop right now. Mm -hmm. um, 
<laughs> and I started thinking, that's really strange. How am I getting that message across to people? How am I getting them to love um, learning about animals? And uh, as, as time went on, I mean, in 25 years, it, it took me a long time to figure it out. But in 25 years, I learned that I was really just I loved those topics. I loved learning about new things. I loved animals. Um, I can talk about Virginia possums till the cows come home. <laughs> I absolutely love possums. And uh, I just, when you're really excited about things, it makes it easy to talk about. And I'm kind of a type A personality. And when I get the opportunity to have a little bit of coffee in me and some uh, happy music, I guess, uh, playing in my head, I just am very enthusiastic about things. I, I'm so passionate about the Festival of Books. Mm -hmm. I can't ever stop talking about that, as Ryan and Jennifer have, have learned over the mm -hmm. years. There's a couple authors, uh, Craig Johnson, I just love, I'm like a big fan girl. Patrick mm -hmm. Hicks, uh, the poet, um, I just, I adore them. As I said, possums, monarch butterflies, just a huge variety of things just really trip my trigger. And I feel like um, I, can, I can probably talk any of you who don't love possums into loving a possum. <laughs> well, I, I look forward to that. <laughs> I hate to interrupt again, but the essence of a newsletter class members every week and that's how fun because you can I can just hear her talking behind it and her and herself just come through with the way she writes and she has little jokes and they're really cornball jokes but I love them <laughs> yeah you look forward to reading them Thank and you God. look forward you know that she also did them and keep you aware of what's going on and stuff. Keep you in the loop, especially this year when everything's so mixed up. She makes you feel like you're still part of that community, even though you may not see each other close up, you see each other on Zooms and stuff. But she has that way of making you feel like you, you belong to something. You and just, that's important. You're an important part of that. Thank you. Thank you. That is so sweet. But I love just that. have to believe, Deb, and I think I've got a believer in Deb. <laughs> um, but I think you just have to believe in things that you're passionate about. Just, just truly feel strongly about them. And your enthusiasm for those things comes out. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to get kind of a little bit under the hood of how you come about enthusiasm. You know, what, as I think Ryan was talking about before, you know, some people have it, some people don't. Is it something, you, is it nature or nurture or both? Or, yeah. I, I think it's some of both, but I also, I guess for me, I think it's, it's uh, well, I guess it's both. Um, you know, my dad is a really enthusiastic guy and he's like the guy in our town that always was the MC at different things. And he'd tell the jokes and he'd dress up like, like a kid to, you know, make a point or, you know, he just, he was very enthusiastic about all of his, all of his passions too. And uh, so I grew up with that. So definitely that, that helps a lot. Um, you know, I remember the first thing I loved, loved, loved from the time I was born, I think, was horses. And <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, I still just love horses. I collected horses for many years. I just love to talk horse racing. I love the history of horses, um, you know, going back to prehistoric horses. I just love all of that. And I remember going to a birthday party in fourth grade and my mom, you know, that was when they dress up the little girls and send them out the door to the birthday party and you'd walk there. And uh, it was, uh, it, Jennifer will remember, it was um, Karen Lonbachen's house. And <laughs> she was kind of a big deal. And I was in fourth grade and my mom, as I went out the door said, 
hey, you know, maybe this time, unless they ask you, don't talk about horses, okay? <laughs> I know it was just my mom being really, you know, trying to get me to fit in or because I've just, I've had a I don't care enthusiasm my whole life. So maybe you are born with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh well if if you're if you're born with it or let's say if you're not born with it do you think that there are ways that you could come about gaining it ah uh, yes okay um, well, how would that how would that work oh well, i'd be interested in hearing what other people think too but um for just like it's really hard to be happy, as happy as you, your best self right now, because of all that's going on in this world. There's some days it, that it just feels crushing, um, but I can, I have ways I can pick myself up and, and find the me that's inside here, the enthusiastic and happy me, because I think I'm naturally an optimistic, happy person. Um, so like this morning, um, I had a big cup of coffee that makes me really happy. <laughs> um, but I also like to put on, I have, I made a playlist on Spotify and uh, I'd like to listen to those are the songs, songs that make me just happy. And I was, uh, singing and dancing around in the porch this morning. And my daughter is home from Chicago. She's, uh, she's, a grown up, but she's working um, out of South Dakota because they're working from home right now. And she's got an office upstairs. And she texted down to me. She's like, is everything okay down there? It's really loud. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but enthusiasm, you know, it just it's easy to make yourself be that way. If you get excited about something like if you hear a song like I love the Black Eyed Peas, um, Oh, I can't think of the name of the song, the one that, that Oprah did the big uh, dance to, dance number two. I love songs like that. And I love some Beatles songs, um, some Beach Boy songs, and those just make me, naturally, I start tapping my feet and moving my head, and I don't have a lot of rhythm. I'm not a really good dancer, but if I can get my arms up in the air, I'm like, yeah, and, <laughs> and then me is back. Then I feel like I'm here. Mm. Well, I think we're going to have a, a very interesting discussion of, in terms of discovering things that we're enthusiastic about. But before we get into that, um, can you tell us some things that you're enthusiastic about other than possums? I mean, oh, you yeah. already mentioned possums. I was ready for possums. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I, I'm not enthusiastic about Sam phone calls. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I'm enthusiastic about my work. I love what I do. I love working with people and giving them the opportunity to learn new things. I am passionate about reading and writing. I've been a writer almost all my life too. I feel so strongly about that. And when I read something that just makes my heart beat and and uh, I can connect to, I get really excited and passionate about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so work, I guess, um, you know, horses, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, for a while, I was super passionate about NASCAR. <laughs> People mm -hmm. are like, ooh, NASCAR, what? But <laughs> I just, I feel like there's so many cool personalities involved in NASCAR. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know, there's just so many things, history, uh, women in history, uh, people from other countries that uh, just amaze me and I wanna learn their culture and their stories. I wanna hear what's behind them. I just love that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there are many things to be enthusiastic about. Oh. And, and, and we'll, we're going to explore some other of your ideas, but I'd like to get some other of our uh, participants uh, involved in this discussion. And I'd like, if you don't feel like uh, saying something, you can just maybe put in the chat a message that you don't want to talk, and that's, that's fine. But I would like to have people talk a little bit about anything that you are enthusiastic about about 
And maybe we'll start with uh, Charles. Well, I think it's important to find your calling, <laughs> that which truly matters to you and uh, persist with it no matter what. I used to talk to my students about that. And uh, I would ask them what they were majoring in. And sometimes um, they didn't seem very enthusiastic about it. But they had been told they should do that. Uh, my dad wants me to do such and such. And so I'm going to do it. And, you know, I went against the grain there. Uh, maybe shouldn't have. Um, but I predicted whoever told them that. Um, to tell them that they really needed to find uh, their calling. So that whatever their work was, it wasn't work. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so there are things, obviously, you have to make a living, but you also have to make a life. And uh, you aren't going to have a very good life if you don't love what you do. And uh, for me, it's for me, it's been teaching. Um, you know, I'll, I'll add something to that. You, earlier, you asked about uh, nature or nurture in terms of enthusiasm. I think children are naturally enthusiastic. They think they're born enthusiastic, and I think life sometimes takes it away from them. And so I think it's extremely important to either retain or regain the child. That's what Wordsworth meant when he said, the child is father of the man. You, you may know that famous short poem, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Uh, so was when I was a child, so be it when I'm old and rough paraphrasing here. Or let me die. Oh. <laughs> There's a kind of death to uh, letting life discourage you. And looking at my son there, I was thinking of, of how often I used to say to my children, look at that sky. There's never been, <laughs> there's never been one like that. There'll never be another one again. Sometimes we'd be out uh, in the boat looking up. You know, sometimes it was a sunset. But that's true. Uh, you can't get into that you've seen one rainbow, you've seen them all, way of thinking about things. <laughs> you have to continue, preserve, you know, grow the child, I think. Um, and one more thing, I was thinking about uh, former students of mine. The first teaching was a year of high school English. And it was so much fun because those kids were so much fun. They were so lively and excited and uh, easy to motivate. And uh, I was full of all kinds of ideas about uh, how to motivate them. And uh, so we did a lot of fun things together and I think we learned together. Well, many years later, they invited me back to one of their reunions and um, it made me sad <laughs> because so many of them seemed so discouraged. <laughs> I kept looking for the children they were, and I wasn't seeing much of that, you know, and I, and I felt sorrow in response to that experience uh, and wondering how life took that enthusiasm away from those exuberant kids I knew, had known so many years ago. That's very insightful. I, I, I really appreciate that you, you brought that out because when we find that we lack enthusiasm, um, that is a very sad thing. You know, when you, you, when you meet people who life doesn't seem to hold anything for them, you know, they can only see what they lack, you know, not what they like. So that's- and sometimes, sometimes, uh, what we do takes that away from us. You know, I'm reminded of Stephen Crane's story of the open boat where they are shipwrecked and they're in this boat together in the stormy seas. And so they have to, to work frantically just to stay afloat. And Crane, Crane says they could not see the color of the sky. <laughs> and, I, and I think sometimes that's, that happens to people. Uh, they're get so uh, they're made so busy by 
life and the pace of life and the process of life. That they don't have time to look up. They could not see the color of the sky. Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, so I can't remember now if we're talking nature or nurture, if we're talking about things that we're enthusiastic about, but maybe it all pulls together. Yeah, things, things that we're, we're, in, uh, we're enthusiastic about. What are you enthusiastic about? I am, I am uh, this will be no surprise, I'm very enthusiastic about books. <laughs> um, although maybe not every kind of book. There's some, some kinds of books like, you know, I'm not big self-help book reader. I will pass those over every time, but fiction and history and good nonfiction and some poetry, um, I get very excited about that. Whereas Thea as a child was crazy about horses, I went through a big phase of being really crazy about deer. I think because of reading Bambi, I wanted a deer in the backyard. Um, my mom said that was not going to work. I was <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, um, I was very enthusiastic about, enthusiastic about dancing growing up. Um, I danced ballet and things like that uh, for a long time. Music, all mm -hmm. kinds of music, all different kinds of genres. Um, like Thea said, if you get the right music, it can put you in the mood you want to be in, whether it's beat or relaxed or whatever it might be, you can pick what you need. Um, and I think about, um, I, I love the, the idea of how children are enthusiastic. I also love that children tend to be just naturally curious about everything, because I think enthusiasm and curiosity are very close to each other. Um, and I think it's, it's important to be a curious person. So I find that, you know, let's say I'm on a long road trip and I'm listening to NPR, they may be doing a story on something that has never occurred to me but they're getting into the details of it. And I find myself fascinated about something that I never thought of before. Um, that enthusiasm comes from the way they're portraying the story. And also just from the fact that life is just sort of fascinating, right? Mm. Um, and one thing I think, since Chuck was talking about teaching, um, my first job out of college was also teaching high school English and journalism. I did that for three years, um, but my student teaching was here in Brookings. And I remember when all the student teachers came in the first day and we had a little uh, talk with the principal and vice principal, and I think it was the vice principal and I'm ashamed to say, I can't remember his name now, but he, one of the things he just said was that old cliche. He said, fake it till you make it. You might come into the classroom in the morning and you're tired or you're not excited about that day's lesson or you've had something unfortunate happen in your personal life or you're running late or whatever it is, but pretend you're happy, pretend you're excited and eventually you will be. And that's sort of been my approach to teaching um, high school. You know, if you're excited, they're gonna be more excited. And then for many years I taught college, you know, College students tend to be sleep deprived, but if you're excited, again, they're excited um, and, and will create some of that enthusiasm. So I think fake it till you make it is, is important. And I think there's some science behind that too, because isn't there, like Thea was talking about having her arms up, isn't there science that says, you know, the more you smile, that actually sends signals to your brain that improves your mood. So I feel like it's not just a, you know, just an emotional thing. It's a physical thing coming from where our emotions come from. So start smiling and you'll eventually feel a little bit more enthusiastic. And beside that, the world will smile with you. Yes, they will. You smile weep and you weep alone. With you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mentioned the curiosity. So I, I'm curious about development of curiosity. Mm. How, would you, uh, how would you say a person develops curiosity it's probably similar to the way that you can develop enthusiasm um i mean i think first you have to have a willingness to have an open mind i tend to be um 
I get very frustrated with something that happens to some teenagers and adults where they they think it's not cool to be excited about things or to be curious about something. They're blase about everything and and you know they they will not let their emotions show. So I mean, I'm not sure how you break through that part, although sometimes again our own enthusiasm and curios curiosity can can start it. Um, but I think if there's just a, a little bit of an open mind, anything that, you know, learning new things is always sort of energizing. So maybe it's a, the matter that you have to keep trying to learn new things mm -hmm. with Ollie or whatever else it might be. Well, mm -hmm. that's, you know, that uh, interests me because I think, you know, you're onto something when you say, you know, it's kind of starts with curiosity. My, one of my life mottos is ABC, always be curious, you know. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering about our interactions with each other. Do we, you know, is there, are there ways that we can um, encourage or support people being curious? Um, yeah. yeah. Maybe we need to, maybe part of it is, I think, asking questions of one another. Yeah, yeah. If I ask you a question, that sparks a response in you, makes you more interested in asking a question of me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think questioning things and, and, you know, we all have some natural desire to know, I think, but we just need to, to spark it sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes too, we, um, we're so afraid of not knowing, you know, or appearing not to know, to be ignorant. Uh, ignorant that the word ignorant has such a negative connotation outside of its actual meaning, you know, because uh, at least for myself, I always consider myself ignorant. You know, it's like there's so many things I'm ignorant about, but then that's why I'm curious. I want to know, but I but I can't know them all at once. You know, so I, I'll take them one at a time or a couple at a bunch, but not I can't get them all at once. You know? um, all right, thank you, Deb. Um, I'm interested in, in um, what are you enthusiastic about, other than Ali? <laughs> you said you're about your your mic, mic. Okay. Many things. I taught first grade for many years. And you taught you taught what? What did you teach? First grade. Oh, first grade. Okay. And. Um, First graders are just naturally curious, enthusiastic little people. It's just, it was fun to be around them every day. Because if, like you said, Jennifer, if you were the one that came in the room tired or garage or had a flat tire on the way to work or something, they're, they're probably, they're ready to go the minute they walk in. There's, no pumping them up. They, they, in fact, do what the, and pretty soon you're, you're excited to turn. There's sometimes, and you're like this too, there's sometimes you're just excited. You didn't even know why you're excited. You just are, because they are, and everything is exciting to them. It's amazing. Some stuff they're excited about. You look at it in a different way than you ever did, a pen, like a pencil sharpener or something. They do think it's boring, but to see it through their eyes, then you think that's a pretty exciting little thing. It's amazing how it works. They're just captivated by everything. It's amazing. And they're like little sponges. They just soak up knowledge or anything good <laughs> and that can be a bad thing too because they suck up anything you don't want them to remember they remember that too but they're just little little miniature people that i i don't think i could teach kindergarten they're like babes in your arms and stuff but first critics are like miniature adults they're, they know enough, they know reading and some math and stuff. It's like they could take on the world. 
kindergartners, they don't have a lineup. They don't know a lot of that stuff. You spend so much time just on how to behave in school. First graders are like, they're so beyond that. <laughs> and they think they're so old <laughs> and creatures of the world and stuff. It's amazing. And one thing I am really enthusiastic about, and I, I get a visual that sleeping under my table right now. Where is that? I am enthusiastic about my Westie. <laughs> He's my third Westie. <laughs> Don't ever ask me anything about a Westie unless you've got like an hour or two to listen. Because I, I just went with all this time on my hands at home and stuff. I went through my bookshelf and got rid I had 14 books on Westies. I was <laughs> like, I think you have enough. <laughs> get rid of those or <laughs> something. I know everything about everything you'd ever want to know about watching, <laughs> which can be good. My son, my dog Jack right now is old. He's old. He's deaf, which is probably a good thing with me blabbing in the zoo. I probably made him deaf. Um, he's deaf, he's arthritic. My son who's 35, when he comes home, he loves all the square fish. He said, he thinks it before it was crazy when I talked to my dog and they can't understand you. He said, now you talk to me, he can't even hear you. I said, thanks for sharing, Chris. <laughs> I never said that again. <laughs> well, thanks, Deb. I, I can see that you are enthusiastic. <laughs> this just this just gives you a little idea. He's going in for his fourth massage on Monday. I've never even had a massage. He's going for his fourth. He fell on the basement step a couple of weeks ago. And the massage part of help him walk a lot better, but it keeps blood flowing to those muscles. Plus, he loves the masseuse. And it, of course, it's funny to me when she stops, a little paw just comes on her arm. Does the scratcher just rest on her arm? Like, don't forget I'm still here. <laughs> so, and she loved that. He <laughs> was, I loved the little guy when he was born of grandpa. Mm -hmm. He is kind of a grouchy old grandpa, kind of. But he's a lovable girl, she grabbed one. And she loves him. And he loves it. I figure, go for it. It's, it's not that expensive. He has fun. She has fun. It's like, what did that hurt? But I'm sure a lot of people would fall right if they knew I, I doc had a massage. They <laughs> would <laughs> just <gotta> be kidding. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, la, 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 I don't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Naima, what are you enthusiastic about? Better yet, what am I not enthusiastic about? <laughs> I am not enthusiastic about baby spiders. <laughs> that is what I'm not enthusiastic about. But then I always say to each his or her own to go like this. Um, <clears throat> yes. Yes. We, um, I too grew up thinking that I was supposed to have a horse, only my horse I wanted to have in the bathtub. My mom said that wouldn't work. Well, at 70, almost 72, uh, we, being here in Elkton, and I was on city council, the mayor said he was going to put this mayor on the table. I said, when hell freezes over and it ain't that cold. So <laughs> my husband, being from the Netherlands, never had ridden a horse or anything like, oh, I made a mess here, wow, um, or did anything like that. 
was taking lessons from down the way. Well, the man from down the way said, yes, we could rescue this horse. So after I rescued my little mare, who turned out to try and be the boss of me, that didn't work. And um, then a, um, another uh, horse, an older horse, which my husband, then uh, they were walking around and they put their heads together, looked like two old men on the field. And uh, so then we rescued 22 horses and we live in you know a lot and a half or something like that in town mm -hmm. and um uh, i talked to a woman one time about my efforts mm -hmm. and um she's one of those life coaches and so on and you know she was saying well you know you could get funding and things like that and i'm thinking funding oh oh yeah well you know i just call somebody up hey you got room whatever i didn't do it you know like on the it was on the down low. Mm -hmm. But she told me something that to this day made me understand me and my responsibility in the world. She, after we had our initial conversation, she said, Naima, if you feel it, and you're not that different than anybody else, and I'm thinking, wonderful, everybody's got it. If you believe it, then it will be. Mm -hmm. If you have that drive and passion, it will be. Mm -hmm. And we worked on trying to have uh, horses be here and there as we were still rescuing and rescuing and rehoming and rescuing and so on. And I talked to her about a month later and she still felt that same way. She said, mm -hmm. you, you exuberate it's like it's coming out of your pores what it is that you're wanting to do. So like everybody is saying, it's your passion. But the one thing when I put it in the chat, because I was thinking I had to go, but now I don't. Um, I wake up every morning with the history of my people within my body. Every single morning I wake up. And I say, I'm on the right side of the dirt. And I do that sometimes because people don't understand. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, what would it be like if you were on the wrong side of the dirt? They go, oh, okay, I understand. Life, every day that you wake up being grateful for it, then after you are awake and you understand and you give thanks, then you can proceed to have some other wonderful things happen. But if you ain't on that side of the dirt, well, who's to say you can't have other things going on, but then that's a whole nother discussion, isn't it? But enthusiasm, I have always been enthusiastic about everything that I have done because as Charles would, was talking about, as a, a person who, who was in class, and I've talked to people that know me now, 50, oh my God. 50 some odd years later, and they say, you haven't changed. I enjoy butterflies. I enjoy horses. I enjoy opossum. I enjoy deer. And that little Westie of yours, oh, that is the cutest thing ever. I enjoy life. And the only way that I have been able to do this, being of this hue, is to understand that I'm here for a purpose and that I will go elsewhere when my purpose has fulfilled. So I wake up and say, well, I'm here again. I must have some stuff to do. And that is ingrained in me. That is both nature and nurture because I never, ever, ever forgot the people that went before me and the struggles of the people that went before me. And I gave it to my kids and I said, well, you know, you go forth and you do what it is that you need to do, understanding that you're on my back as I stand on my mother's and so on and so forth. And I think a lot of people forget about the struggles that others have had. And in schools and in life in general, people get bullied and somebody doesn't step in and say, stop that because of the fear of being or fear of not being and so on and so forth. In the old days, it was just, that was the way. You walked home from school, you were doing something wrong. Your mom got a call before you got home 
So you got fussed at by the old lady on the porch. And when you got home, you say, Miss so-and-so called and you were doing, and you go, dang, I got in trouble twice. I better not do that again. Either that I got to sneak a little bit better, but then that never happened because my mom had people over in Minneapolis. I grew up in St. Paul. And I go to Minneapolis and my mom gets a call and say, well, is your daughter over and so and so and so and so? And this was no cell phone. I get home. Were you over there on Hennepin? No, we were over at, uh, you know, no, you were over there with those kids and you were up there dancing around first app, you know, all the rest of that. That doesn't happen anymore. And at some point in time, we the people need to work towards having that happen and not everybody has that same experience and if we can get excited about sharing our experiences and you know not people not looking at me as oh you're exotic well yeah i am exotic and i'm no different than any other person that looks like me you know exotic is is you you know so I'm going to stop because I could go on, but enthusiasm is both nature and nurture. And again, the understanding in your heart that you woke up and you had a job to do, whether it was to smile at people, to, to, to have that massage, whether it's people or dog, what, you had a job to do. You have a job to do. And A, the payment is doing the work. And I think everybody in religion knows that work well, I'll stop there. Well, I will say the first time I saw you, the first word that came to mind was exotic. <laughs> so you're right. <laughs> An enthusiastic exotic person. That was, that was the second word. That was the second <laughs> word. <laughs> okay, Lee, what are you enthusiastic about, Derek? <laughs> Well, I identify, as I said, to Thea. Mm -hmm. I, mine was mainly nature. Mm -hmm. I was not my surroundings. I was running away from home and I spent a lot of time on Sunday afternoons on my bike in the back country. I studied insects, animals, grasses, you name it, anything and everything I could find. And I have been curious to this day to the fact that I love people. And I, I call him my new husband because I met him after 50 years being my best friend years ago. And he said, I think you interrogate people. But I think people have such an interesting background. I just love meeting people. And before I get any further, every one of you, are so insightful. You have so much to add to this conversation. I have found my niche. Only <laughs> I was curious because I thought, humanities, what's that stuff? And so I jumped in and I do that. I never say no, but I learn about everything. I have been known to, there were five, six cement structures trucks ready to put cement in new housing. Tom and I were walking and I was curious about those cement trucks and the guys were standing waiting their turn. And I just went up to one and I said, uh, can I ask you questions about how this works and you know, and how, what's the inside and what you do and what levers? And he said, sure. That's how I learn. Mm -hmm. I have stopped farmers in the field and ridden with them to learn about corn picking because I was at the time what 60 years ago when I used to do that mm. and it's it's inborn in me and then very quickly because I have to go see my not I get to go see my husband um I was fixing fence with my dad and I had to have been about seven six or seven, because I remember vividly. And there's a, a wrench that you, when you fix fences, a barbed wire fence that you loosen up the wires to replace them. And I was always asking questions, always. 
And this one day I asked him something and he just said, okay, one more question. And I said, what's that? And no, I said, why? <laughs> he threw the wrench up and it almost hit me on the back of me and fell on the ground. And, and he said, is that all you do is ask questions? <laughs> <laughs> so saying that, I do have to leave. Yeah. And thank you again for all you do. I love hearing about teachers. I was a teacher. And yes, it is contagious. Yeah. I've had students come back to me yeah. and said, you just never let us rest. <laughs> so Thea, I've noticed your enthusiasm from day one. Thank you for leading Ollie. And I really appreciated seeing Deb. I think you were in an Ollie class and you impressed me with your questions there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lee. We're glad to have you and uh, come back next week when we're- Oh, are you going to show. speak on Christmas? Oh, that's right. I, I, I don't know. Well, watch out for our, our uh, uh, promo. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm alone. I mean, I'm, I don't have any family around here. So I'm alone and Christmas is just another day for me. I mean, not that. <laughs> <laughs> but well, I'll, I'll wait for your notice. Thank you All again. Right. Lee, yeah, Lee, Lee, you we can we can zoom each other. We're gonna be just kind of hanging out on Christmas. You, we can zoom each other. Have really? a good time. Yeah, why not? Did you know Tom was from Brookings? Jennifer. I I don't think that I did. Yeah, he was a banker at First Bank and Trust. I wasn't living with him then, but yeah, we got about 14 years ago. Uh huh. Oh, but nice. he, oh, uh, he went to state, I went to the U, and of course I said he couldn't get into the U because he didn't qualify. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Have a very good holiday if I don't see you. All right. <laughs> Ryan, what are you enthusiastic about? Um, there's a lot of things, uh, but the main two are music and literature, reading and writing. Um, I play music and I write a lot. And there's a few things that have occurred to me during this conversation. Um, one thing I was going to say initially, which I think is so important is finding other people who are enthusiastic about what you are. Um, because if you don't have those people and you're enthusiastic about something, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just going to kind of fall flat and you're not going to, you know, get a reaction from anybody else. And you're just going to kind of think, well, maybe this isn't that cool of a thing to be interested in because nobody cares what I say about it. Um, and I've gotten lucky enough the past few years to meet other musicians and people who are interested in that kind of thing. And it's like, um, this one guy that I write songs with, we'll talk for two hours, um, just about songwriting and like, we'll talk over each other and we'll get all excited. And it's just like, before that, I didn't have somebody like that. So it's just kind of like, enthusiasm is contagious and it has to be somebody who shares your interests. And I also think um, this is sort of my personal opinion about what, what goes on in society a lot these days, but what Jennifer said about intellectual curiosity, and I know my dad obviously <laughs> agrees with this, it's, that's so important. And, and I would point to reading with that because if and it's it's also about healthy enthusiasm because if you don't develop intellectual curiosity through reading or just whatever you're interested in that's at least something positive or something you're going to get out of something out of then you can develop these really unhealthy enthusiasms um and just kind of be overcome with negativity. You can become an enthusiastic about being negative. And 
I, I think that's just rampant in our society these days. And I think a lot of it is that people don't read much and they're on social media all the time and they're, you know, doing things like that where they don't have anything in their life that they're enthusiastic about. They don't have anything that they can say, oh, well, I, I'm really interested in this and I'm, I'm practicing this hobby and I'm trying to do this. You know, if you're not trying to actively learn something in your life, then you're, you're going to be kind of a miserable person. And that's just going to sort of, you're going to exude that. Um, and, and I just think the intellectual curiosity is so important. And that's what, that's what comes from reading. Um, and I, I've kind of like the last four or five years, I've, I've just done a ton of reading and stuff. And before that, I kind of went through this phase where all I did was just watch sports which there's nothing wrong with sports, but that was what I was enthusiastic about. But it was like, that's not satisfying at all. I mean, if you're, if that's your enthusiasm that you cheer for a sports team, you, you don't get anything back from that. And that's just a personal experience of mine. I've just noticed that intellectual curiosity is, has been so much more rewarding for me, so. Very interesting. Uh, a lot of a lot of points there, but I want to move on to uh, Barb. Barb, what are you enthusiastic about besides disco dancing? <laughs> your your mic, Barb. Mike, Mike, Mike. Your your microphone's off, Barb. There we go. There. Start over. Uh, we missed okay. <laughs> Throughout my life, I think I've had different, like many of you have had different things I've been enthusiastic about. Uh, as a child, our family traveled a lot. So seeing new and different places was really fun. Uh, after I moved to South Dakota uh, and I lost my husband, I became sort of by accident, very enthusiastic about stained glass, um, which uh, was really amazing and South Dakota was the perfect place to study stained glass and see all the different uh, creative uh, things that happen in glass. And those travels took me to meet not only people in South Dakota, but other people throughout the country and actually the world who sort of inspired me to not only know about glass, but all of the different things that those people were interested in. Since my recent health crisis, my travels have been rather curtailed, as has the disco dancing. And I think that I found a whole new world because of the environments I've been in, uh, where uh, isolation and quarantine is sort of the overriding factor. Uh, I have never lost interest in books, but I have rediscovered all kinds of books. And, books that I would never have read. Uh, thanks a lot to what the Humanities Council has done the past three years with the Festival of Books. Uh, I, I just finished reading, I think a couple of years ago, we had a speaker about wolves. I just finished the wolf book. That was really neat. Um, and I, I think that, you know, when you physically can't pursue the things that you were enthusiastic about in the past, uh, reading and books open up a whole new set of possibilities that you can explore and examine and see how they're going to impact your life in the future. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you found uh, ways uh, to um, spread your enthusiasm for those things to other people? Oh, yeah. Even in isolation quarantine, uh, you're dealing with staff members who are all gowned up and they wear masks and shields and you don't even know who they are because they can't show their name tags because they're underneath all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really sometimes it's hard to connect. Um, but thanks to several of you in this group, uh, you, you've sent me material that I can sort of leave at the mailboxes because we can't gather. 
uh, so that people can, uh, uh, you know, perhaps find a new interest or something they can be enthusiastic about. Uh, I've also been baking cookies. I think I've made 10 different varieties in the last week. So, uh, and uh, sharing those cookies uh, with uh, some of the people here has been, it just really made me enthusiastic again. You wouldn't believe that a cookie could make somebody so happy, <laughs> but it does. I remember the cookie monster. He was always happy when he got Oh, it. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Uh, is that Paul? It, yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm tardy, uh, but I don't think that that'll banish me from the group, uh, <laughs> considering I've been absent so many times anyway. So you, you're stuck with me now. <laughs> okay, so what are you enthusiastic about? Oh, wow. Uh, I, surfing is the first thing that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, it, although I'd like to think I'm enthusiastic about a lot of things. It's just something that the the energy and the interconnectedness of it all and just, you know, the um, physical and mental rejuvenation of it is just something that I, I, I can't get enough of and uh, am so grateful that it's it's part of my life. And then the, the camaraderie with whether I'm surfing with friends or just the uh, other people who are on the waves uh, who I don't know, or the people who are on the beach or on the strand, it's just, there's just an energy and, and soul cleansing uh, uh, um, activity that uh, I, I just love. It makes me smile. Even if I've had a bad day on the waves, it's come out smiling and, and uh, refreshed. What's that like, that bad day on the wave? What's that? <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Bad day on the wave means you fall off several waves and you know, physically just don't have it geared up or, or mentally, because a lot of a lot of it is um, is uh, wave selection. And some days uh, when you're at my skill level, you just don't have uh, you don't have it geared up right. And uh, and you spent most of your time uh, at the bottom of a, of a wave with it crashing on top of you. Um, <laughs> And, uh, uh, in any event, that's that's what I'll that's what I'll go with today. Yeah. Uh, or, or the day when the when the board comes behind you and hits you in the head. <laughs> exactly. awesome. I, I've got a nice cut on my foot uh, to prove that that waves do or that boards do inflict uh, damage, but we won't yeah. we'll take a look at that. Yeah. Great, great, Alphonse. What what are you enthusiastic about? Okay, first a few, a few observations. Uh, as a part of my educational experience, I, I had to learn developmental psychology and learned a long time ago that we're hardwired for learning languages, regardless of where we are in the world, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. But this discussion is making me think now, I think that we're also hardwired for curiosity. I don't know I mean, the only, only exception that I can think of is children who do not form attachments. And I don't wanna go into all of the psychology about attachment, but otherwise that, that, that curiosity that children display, even through symbolic play, is just absolutely fascinating. Okay, enough about that. I, I'll start off by saying, I'm fortunate enough to have been born into the city of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I was surrounded by the arts and not really understanding that as a youngster, just taking it all in was what happened for me such that even now, as of this morning, when I was watching CBS morning show and one of the anchors was talking about New York City, all of a sudden my mood changed completely because it was all about the arts that we learn about I mean, that you can experience when you're in New York City and that I would always visit the city because I could indulge in every art form. I mean, growing up in New Orleans, I, I was able to do plays, I was able to play music, I was able to do uh, public speaking, blah, blah, blah. There were all of these ways in which I was connected. And it wasn't until later in life, though, that I learned about Joseph Campbell. And Campbell introduced me to this whole notion of the way in which we connect mythologies 
And given, given my work in Africa and in the United States, I'm always paying attention to um, that which the ancestors have left us with and what it is that we're thinking about for future generations. It's, it's a really, really interesting way in which I've sort of grown into that curiosity that I was born into and as we all are born into and then got nurtured in my, my home city of New Orleans and then to be educated in such a way to, to continue. I mean, you know, I, I, I have to say that I'm incredibly fortunate that I got to be a university person uh, where I could always entertain my curiosities, always entertain them. And then I'll close with what, how is it that I share it? Uh, so as Tom Fishback, Paul's brother, will tell you, it was 20 years ago that he was in a course that I wrote on playwright August Wilson. And that was at the invitation of one of the departments on campus. And it has become the mainstay for me and students from 20 years ago, especially now that Denzel Washington is about to try to mount on film the 10 plays by Wilson. And with Ma Rainey going to debuting tomorrow, mm -hmm. it's like that enthusiasm that I had for the arts and in particular the theatrical arts was something that I could, again, display as a part of my life in the, in the university such that it impacted a whole bunch of, well, I only taught it for three years, uh, but for three years, I was able to impact that, bring that enthusiasm for my, my involvement with the theatrical arts to a group of students, 18 students. Interesting and ex exciting to hear that, you know, that kind of transference is going on. I always appreciate that. I want to turn back now to Thea. Um, and let's, if you could share with us what you think is um, a way for people to discover what they are enthusiastic about, you know, because sometimes, you know, well, let's put it this way. When we, we start out, maybe we're curious about a lot of things, but we don't know all the things and we still we never really know all the things that we could be enthusiastic about they're out there waiting for us so how do you discover something you could be enthusiastic about Thea? wow uh well i see deb's raising her hand so she may have a great idea mm -hmm. but but um, you know, not to plug my program, but um, taking classes and and uh, checking out things like on Ali, um, yeah. and through the South Dakota Humanities Council and the South Dakota Festival of Books, places like that, you can really even community ed in your own community, you can try something that maybe sounds interesting, and you'll be surprised. Um, how many ways there are to find something new to be passionate about. Just like um, who was talking about stained glass, Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can just, you can find new things so easily. You do have to look a little bit though. <laughs> yeah, well, one of the things that I've found is that we uh, sometimes don't know how to explore or that there is a thing like such as exploring or we're afraid here, you know, we're afraid of making a mistake or being laughed at or being, uh, let's say, ridiculed or something like that for trying something different. And if we get stuck in that, uh, then we're afraid to move past the place we are at that moment. And so we can, and, and stuck in that place, it seems like we can uh, have a sense of being imprisoned, which we are. It's one of my yeah. big complaints in living is that so many people are culturally imprisoned. You know, they, are, they don't go outside of what is their culture. And inside their culture, they're even imprisoned because their culture says, 
that's your place. And, and you stay in your place, stay in your lane, stay in your place. Mm -hmm. And with so many restrictions, we may not be able to see all we can be, you know? So I'm kind of looking for uh, ways to um, escape cultural imprisonment, you know, to get out of that thing that says, well, this is, what, this is who you are, this is your definition. We're gonna tell you who you are, not only within the greater society, but within our society, this is who you are, stay in your life. How do we, how do we get out of that? Well, one of the, I, I, I see Naima has something too, but um, one of the things I have, I think we all have here, I don't know, like Ryan and Paul, I don't know how old they are, but the gift of age um, makes it easier to, um, the older I get, the less I'm afraid or care what people think if I'm dancing around because there's an author in town. Yeah, some of my friends might go, that's weird. You know, I could see you dancing around for, um, you know, a rock star or something like that. Like, uh, uh, what's his name? David, um, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of his name. The CBS Morning Reporter was in, David Bagno was in Sioux Falls just a couple weeks ago. And my daughter's a journalism major like I am. And we were like, let's go find him. <laughs> and we didn't get out of our cars and we didn't talk to him, but we did go find him <laughs> and looked at him out the window. And, uh, you know, um, I don't care anymore because I'm just at an age where it doesn't matter to me. I might embarrass my daughter a little bit, but mm -hmm. age is definitely a gift that we are given to help us get over that. Um, I'm sure there's other things too, but I feel like age is the greatest gift. Mm -hmm. Okay. Naima, did you have, you turned it off. Oh yeah, I, I'm sorry. I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that this was a, you know, a, a real important call. And it was, did you know that your vehicle was out of warranty? <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I, when you're talking about getting out of comfort zones and, and all kinds of different things, I, I just might be a rebel or something, but I, I well, for instance, uh, I was singing Peter, Paul and Mary. And people looked at me like, you're, and I just did it because it made me feel, you know, I could say I influenced Charlie Pride, but then that'd be a lie, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it just, just being able to give yourself permission to do what it is that you feel you want to do. And, and it's feel that you know you want to do not you believe that you know you want to do and you might end up doing one of those what do they call those flash dances you might be Thea you might be doing something I look and go oh Thea's getting down and you know we just get busy it just it's it, enthusiasm is infectious mm -hmm. you know it's an infection that really has no cure, not unless somebody puts a kibosh and you all go to jail or something, but it's an infection. You will infect people with your excitement. And then they'll also want to question, there's that curiosity too, Jennifer. What, why, why are you, why are you, why do you feel this way? You know, why do you say, someone literally asked me, why are you singing folk songs? Isn't that a little out of your comfort zone? I said, no, I can reach the notes, Peter, Paul, and Mary. You know, I'm like Mama Cass. I'll <laughs> tell you to sing for your supper all the time. <laughs> if you feel it, just go ahead and give yourself permission to do it because uh, there are a lot of things that people don't necessarily want to give you permission to do. And there are things that are laws, the laws of the land and the universe, and sometimes the law of the land can be changed nicely. But you got to do you. You don't have to wait for someone else. And I think it starts with the children, what Charles was doing. I, 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 I know the feeling, Charles, because there are kids that they still call me Miss Naima and how are you and, you know, want to be uh, on Facebook. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, I guess they're old enough. You know, they've got children. 
<laughs> but um, yeah, just do it. Mm -hmm. just, just do it. As they say, just do it. Do it to see what happens. You can infect a lot of people. And then when you do that, that's your peeps. That's your cadre. That's, that's, that's your wing, your uh, wind beneath your wings. Mm -hmm. Charles, you, what were you going to say? Well, thinking when uh, folks were talking about uh, continuing to be enthusiastic uh, into golden years, <laughs> there are really bookend cliches about aging. One is you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> and the other is you're never too old to learn. <laughs> And you really have to uh, focus on the, the last one because it's true. I'm puzzled sometimes when people ask me about my retirement and they'll say, because they knew I was fully engaged for many years as a teacher and loved it. Um, what are you finding to do? What are you doing in retirement? It's a, it's a question which seems to suggest some sympathy on their part because now I'm done with what I do. And I think that's such a strange perspective because there aren't enough hours in the day for me to do what I'm interested in doing. You know? It's just exciting to be able to continue to do things and to continue to do other things. Of course, I pursue my, my interests, which were my teaching enthusiasms, but many other things as well. And now I have time for those things. And it, it, it's so sad to think of people thinking, well, that's it for me. <laughs> uh, I'm done. You know. Walking dead. <laughs> you're, you're dead before you you're dead before you die. You know, I mean, that sounds kind of harsh. But if you let yourself get into that mode, old age is a lot of fun, you know, I think. Yeah, it beats the alternative, I'll tell you. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> I think Deb has been chomping at the bit to add something. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, it, you know, we are coming up on uh, the end of our um, exciting adventure here. Uh, I want to uh, thank Thea for, for uh, being our uh, spark for this enthusiastic conversation about enthusiasm. Um, I am really happy to know about Ollie. I will be following up on that and uh, you know, seeing uh, what kind of interesting things I can find, because I always find that those are, you know, finding classes where there, there are um, subjects that I don't know about, that's one of the things I love to do. And just as much being with people or finding groups of people who are also interested in things. One of the conversations I have with young people when they say, oh, I'm bored, you know, you just say, only boring people are bored. <laughs> you know, if you, if you, uh, there's so many things to be exciting, excited about, or people will say, oh, there's so much bad news or something. I say, well, you're just not engaged. Because if you do things like, even just watch like the TED Talks, you know, Rodney and I were yeah. talking about this earlier. You watch the TED Talks. You you uh, go to some classes like uh, Ali classes or just, if you will find that there are people who are working on and actually having successes in the things that you're saying, thinking the world is going to hell in a handbasket because you're only listening to those people as if that is the world. You know, that is the world as defined by a few people who, whose business it is to keep you engaged, you know? So that is not, you know, that's the world. If it occupies that much space in your head, then yeah, that, you know, the world is a terrible place, but there's so many people out there who are doing interesting things and leading interesting lives, you know? And to uh, piggyback on Charles's uh, uh, ideas about, you know, aging and being, you know, enthusiastic. You know, the thing that I find that is a switch, I, I actually retired when I was 35, you know, and I retired at 35 for five years because I, I realized that a lot of people were dying 
after really within five years after their retirement. And I figured I'm going to get mine in when I, while I can walk around. And I was fortunate enough to, to be in an economic position to do that. And so I figured now I will work till I die. There is no retirement. But one of the things I, I noticed about retirement is that what you do switches from obligation to option. You now have a choice of what you do when you get in the morning, up in the morning. And suddenly you are busier than ever because you that's what you want to do. If all you want to do is sit down and rot, you can do that. But then there are all these other things that, you know, the health permitting you can do. And even if health doesn't permit, you find other interesting things to do. So uh, I'm hoping that this discussion uh, will encourage you not only to be enthusiastic or more enthusiastic, but also to encourage others to be enthusiastic that we can share our enthusiasm and suggest ideas to people. Or in many cases, that person who is like the curmudgeon, you know, who's always thinking that the world is, you know, there's just nothing to do or it's just terrible, invite them along to something. Invite them to come here, and, you know, to, to, to uh, share these discussions with us. And if, if that's not their cup of tea, Show them some of the other things that you're interested in and live your enthusiasm, you know, because if you're enthusiastic, as others have indicated here, other people see that and maybe they will say, well, that person's so much interested in that. I wonder what that's about. Or just they may not even say anything to you, but they have started looking into it, you know. So uh, with that, uh, Ryan, can you talk about what uh, we'll be exploring next week? Yes, we'll be talking about food and holidays. And this is another case where our, our day falls on Christmas Eve, which I know is sort of a holiday. But um, my theory with that, with and that's why we did our Thanksgiving program, too, is I know some people this year with the quarantine and stuff aren't able to see their family. So would you all be interested in the Christmas Eve program or do you guys all have stuff going on or does anybody have thoughts on that? I'm down with it and for Christmas Day too. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm of course interested because I'm especially things about food and I hope that people will bring some ideas about food and how food uh, uh, impacts, you know, the holidays and how food impacts our interactions with other people. And everybody bring a recipe of something you think is uh, different. <laughs> Lauren, you would love Thea's newsletter each week. It has a recipe at the bottom. They're wonderful. <laughs> Great. It's kind of a combination. <laughs> well, count me on that list, please. Good. Well, we'll, are, we'll... Are, are we supposed to show, you know, like go like this and show what we're, you know, are. It's up to, it's up to you. It's up <laughs> to you. It, it's a, it, it'll be a free for all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, free for most people. Some will make pay, you know, but it's, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, come back next week thinking of food. All right. Well, see you all. Thanks for coming. And uh, until next time. Yes. Thank you, Thea. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.